going on? All right. Hello, gentlemen. It's good to see you. So what do you do when you're a Democrat and the election is less than two weeks away? You throw up the bat signal and this guy shows up. We, we hear you play a little basketball. That's why we see it. I, just, <laughs> I gotta admit, my game is a little broken at this point. <laughs> but, you know, I might, uh, looking around, I'm, some of y'all I might take. <laughs> this week, former president Barack Obama is in the swing state of Pennsylvania, campaigning for his former VP, Joe Biden. Now, Obama's first stop was a roundtable in Philly, talking to black men who are leaders in the community about the issues facing them today and the importance of turning out the vote. One, one of the biggest tricks that's perpetrated on the American people is this idea that the government is separate from you. The government's us, of, by, and for the people. It wasn't always for all of us. But the way it's designed, it works based on who's at the table. And if you do not vote, you are not at the table. And then, yes, then stuff is done to you. If you're at the table, then you're part of the solution. It was black support in South Carolina that helped get Joe Biden the nomination. Now. He's looking to expand upon the 81% of black men who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign is trying to get black men on their side, like with this ad featuring a black truck driver. To me, Trump is a freaking godsend. To me, Trump is what is, is, is life. To me, Trump is a second chance. But there is a science majority out there. I talk to him. I got, I got people that I work with on a daily basis saying, yo, man, we got to do something. 14% of black male voters went for Trump in 2016. Now, I know it doesn't really sound like a lot, but it's more than some of his Republican predecessors got. And he's going for an even bigger share this time around. I did more for the black community in 47 months than Joe Biden did in 47 years. I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. Today, why in the final days before the election, both parties are trying to get black men to the polls. There's no one better on any of this stuff than Cornell Belcher. He's a Democratic pollster and NBC News and MSNBC political analyst. He worked on the Obama campaigns in 08 and 2012 and has his own polling and strategy firm called Brilliant Corners. Cornell Belcher, man, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. The pleasure is mine, brother. I've been uh, checking you out and I've been wanting to have this conversation. I, pre I feel like every week I'm like, where's Cornell? It's like that, that Chappelle show where he's like, where's Ja? I'm like, yo, where's Cornell Belcher? <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need some help in understanding this, man, because... Now, we covered a lot of ground, but I started with this push to get black men to the polls. You know, I've always wondered, efforts like this, is it pandering or an actual genuine attempt to bring black men into the fold? Well, no, but you got to make the case. Look, every presidential candidate for on the Democratic side from Buttigieg to, to Biden to Harris, Bloomberg put out a specific plan for addressing inequality in our society. Tremaine, sometimes we gotta, we gotta know when we're winning. I mean, because of our demands, the, the system is, is acting. And one of the biggest knocks of, of the Obama years, and I understand this especially early on, was that there were no policy prescriptions specifically for black people. Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward. You can't be serious in, in politics right now, particularly on the Democratic side, if you don't have specific policy prescriptions for, for black people. That's a victory. Now, it's not the end of the game, but we got to take it and we got to run with it. So when you drop out of the process, you are in fact seeding the ground to others who don't have your interests. And what I would argue to, to brothers is, if you wanna protect your community, if you want to make things better in, in your communities and for you and your family, 
you can't see that political ground and power to, to others because you don't like the game, right? The game is the game. And you got to play the game or you and your people are going are gonna to suffer the consequences now. Well, in, in, playing, in playing the game, Cornell, you know, the good brother Ice Cube, the OG, caught some flack because he said, you know what? I, I have an idea for Black America, a contract with Black America, and I don't care who's willing to engage with me. So he said he presented it to Biden. He presented it to the Trump administration. And Biden said, you know what? Let's wait until after the election. Trump said, you know what? Come, come on and let's talk. But... You know, Ice Cube is saying, let's play the game. Let's not just put all our eggs in one basket. Let's appeal to Trump. And if he's willing to put, as, as his plan calls for $500 billion investment in the black community, why not do that? Have we actually seen what the Congressional Black Caucus's platform for is? and what the I don't, plan- I, don't, I don't think many have. And what their plans are? Because here's the thing. All of a sudden, Ice Cube didn't come. And look, I, I, I love the brothers acting and I have a couple of his albums. And I appreciate what he's trying to do. But let's step back and level set. Um mm-hmm. We don't need another plan. <laughs> what I talked about is there are a number of plans. And if you look at what the Congressional Black Caucus has put forward and is trying to move, is sitting in the Senate dying because Mitch McConnell and Republicans aren't going to move on it. If Donald Trump wanted to do something for, for, for Black Americans, he would tell Mitch McConnell to live up off of the Justice and Policing Act right now. So we got to understand the game, Right. And talk about sort of being hoodwinked. The plan's already there. Act on the plan. So in in terms of of reaching out to black men, which seem to be shaping up to be a really crucial demographic for so many reasons, uh, Joe Biden's got this ad running right now that focuses on black men, and he's in the barbershop, which again, sometimes, you know, it bothers me sometimes that the only place people tend to find black men at the barbershop. We exist in other places, but it is effective in, in it being a center of, of community. And in this ad, one of the brothers says, you know, it, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. If we don't lead that effort to make things better, we can't ask other people to do it. There is no good reason not to vote. You cannot sit on the sidelines. You gotta get in the game. It was a well done ad and it seems genuine. The brothers' voices in there seem like brothers that we would know. But is that kind of thing actually effective in reaching brothers who might not otherwise be inclined? You, you have to compete. And there's not, there's not a silver bullet. Um, you know, I'm also, I'm going to push back on the damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of mm-hmm. narrative that, that too often gets caught up, right? It's, it's, so if there aren't in our cultural places having conversations mm-hmm. with us, it's bad, but if they if they are, that can be bad too, right? Right. But the power of that ad, I think, is real brothers talking about what they have to do and what's going on in their community and how they bring about change. And it is very much this ideal that if you want change to happen, you can't just expect change to ha- to happen without you without you taking a part in it. So this ideal of, re- of responsibility and power is something that, from my research, I've been telling people one of the things that correlates strongest with non-participation is whether or not they think they have power. And it's, and it's something we started, I started tracking going back to the Obama years. If a voter doesn't think they have power, they are not very likely to participate, right? So you have to give them a sense of power that they in fact can change things and then connect that power up to policies that that they want right and but but and that's just politics 101 so when we say we want criminal justice reform and my vote I'm going to give you my vote cuz you're going to act on criminal justice reform that's the political system working that's how the political system is supposed to work now, you know, on the, on the flip side, Trump is, is kind of flipping that narrative, and they have a commercial out now with uh, Herschel, Herschel Walker. Walker. I've known Donald Trump for 37 years. He keeps right on fighting to improve the lives of black Americans. He worked night and day. He never stops. He leaves nothing on the field. And Georgia State Representative uh, Vernon Jones, and again, Jones is a Democrat or has worn a, you know, worn a badge for a while. Joe Biden has had 47 years to produce results but he's been all talk and no action. Just like so many of the Democrats who've been making promises to the black voters for decades. Is that kind of ad effective? The idea of powerlessness, the idea that Democrats look at your communities. They talk about it, but they're not really about it. Does that work? Well, it it hasn't because Biden has has anything from a 10 to 12 point lead. 
Mm-hmm. And, and he's close to garnering a Obama-like performance numbers among, among African-American voters. But look, if 100% of the black vote is the thing, it, it's going to be failure. Right. And it's ridiculous. Okay, so 10, 12, 13% of African-Americans vote Republican. Are we expecting African Americans? I've had the same thought. <laughs> like, what, what is what is winning? You need a hundred? You need ninety nine? Right. I mean, and it's can like, you have some brothers with bad politics? <laughs> it's like we we say that the black blacks aren't monolithic, but then we want hundred percent of blacks to vote for you know, and that's just not how any of it's worked, and it's not how history's worked. Look, you've had twelve or thirteen percent of African Americans voting Republican for a long time. I mean, go back to George Bush. Go back before then, <laughs> right? It's you're going to get a certain percentage of, of black people who are going to be Republican. I'm not worried about that 12 or 13% of black people who are vote Republican. And we seem to be obsessed. And I think part of it, Train, is this ideal that, well, we go, well, Donald Trump's clearly a racist. How could anyone black be for Donald Trump? It's almost offensive. But we got to let that go. Look, and, and I'm more worried about us getting those several million African Americans, particularly those brothers, who didn't participate, who voted for Obama and didn't participate in 2016, I'm a lot more worried about getting them back into the process than I am, you know, worried about if 12 or 14 percent of, of blacks are going to vote for Donald Trump. You know, 14 percent of what? I mean, I guess it's, it sounds like you're saying, you know, because black voters do tend to vote for Democrats, if more black people come out, then it will be a net win for for Democrats. But there is a, a, a stat here, and I know we shouldn't be surprising. Like, what do you want? Complete allegiance and lockstep. That's ridiculous. We should be able to have, um, you know, freedom of political thought. But there's one stat that shows that 18 percent of young black men under 50 support Donald Trump. That seems like the opposite of what we saw with the Obama coalition and young folks coming out and being so tuned in to the social matters of the day, police reform and all that stuff. Isn't that just a little concerning? The idea that if you can chip off some young people here in a Wisconsin, in a Milwaukee, chip off some young black folks over here in a Florida. All right, let's do some more math. <laughs> right? And I'm not, and I'm a journalist for a reason. So if my math, <laughs> so please but, give me some math. But so what are we, so, so, so what are we talking about? So, okay. So 80 plus <laughs> so, right, still, of, of young in... black men are voting for, for Joe Biden, and it, it is like so. So we're getting really worked up over that. I mean, it's the forest for the trees, right? Mm. Do, do I want eighteen percent of 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 young black men voting for Donald Trump? No, but but to your point earlier, so we have to have a hundred percent allegiance. That's just not realistic, right? Mm. Find a number like that eighteen percent in that now in that in that group, and we inflate it and we drive a narrative around that. When the narr- when when the truth of the matter is. That Joe Biden is is a lot closer to Barack Obama's like performance among Black voters than Hillary Clinton was. Joe Biden is anywhere between, you know, eighty seven or 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 eighty nine percent of 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 Black voters. I mean, come on, Tremaine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have to take a break, and when we come back, Cornell and I talk about the polling and strategy around Black voters in twenty twenty. Stick with us. We're back with Cornell Belcher. You know, I think in 2016, many of us felt, you know, hoodwinked and and bamboozled and led astray by the polls. And I know you do this, man. Can we trust these polls? Like, is there anything happening different now than what we saw happen in 2016 in terms of, like, where we stand with the candidates? Well, let's unpack that. The public poll was actually better in 2016 than it was in 2012. So the narrative was wrong. The polling wasn't that wrong. The the narrative was really wrong when and that it was a two-person race. And the Russians were making sure that it wasn't, in fact, a two-person race. What did Donald Trump get in, in Wisconsin? Did he get a majority in Wisconsin? No. Did he get a majority in Pennsylvania? No. Did he get a majority in Florida? No. Um, <laughs> um so did he get a majority in Michigan? No. All these sort of key industrial state uh, industrial states, he got by with a bare plurality in 2016 that would have been a a losing percentage in 2012. Hmm. Um, what did he get in Florida? He got 49%. Mitt Romney got 49% in Florida and lost. And Hillary, and take a state like Wisconsin, which was, which was a key pivotal state and sort of encapsulates 
um, the protest vote, uh, the young voters, Hillary Clinton is off of Barack Obama's margin in a state like Wisconsin by almost the exact percentage point of people protesting their vote, voting third party. And so you, what you had was an erosion of the, of the Obama coalition, particularly that youth portion of that Obama coalition, which, were, which was instrumental to, to Barack Obama uh, winning election. A lot of young voters, especially young voters of color. This idea of, you know, obviously, you know, Trump is going to get a certain chunk of black voters, but it's still, you know, in the whole, a small portion of black voters. But it also matters where fo- folks are showing up and showing up to vote and getting them turned out. I know, I know, I know you were working with uh, J- the Jamie Harrison Senate campaign, which has really shocked a lot of people, man. I mean, you think about Lindsey Graham, but now you have this young black Democrat challenger who raised, was it 57 million I, last lost quarter? Count. But when you think about turnout for um, the folks who might care about this race in particular and black folks coming out to support Jamie Harrison, does that end up doing anything when it comes to like the Biden ticket, right? Like does that one race change anything? I'm, gl- oh, I'm glad you brought this point up because then this is, because again, this is about the math. If the African-American electorate it's the African American share of the electorate in, in South Carolina looks like the the share of the electorate that they were in say 2016 or even in 2014. Jimmy Harrison's not going to be the senator. If the, Af- if the share of that African American electorate is, is about two percent higher, there's a good chance that Jamie's going to be senator of, of South Carolina. That's the power. Here and that's the point I'm and that's the point I'm trying to make. So I'm not getting yeah. caught up in the few percentage points of blacks who are voting Republican, right? I'm, or am I trying to change the face of the electorate? But when you think about the other battleground states, right? These elections usually come down to just a handful of states because the others have typically not been in play necessarily. But when you think about Ohio and Pennsylvania, um, Wisconsin and Michigan. How important? How critical is the black vote in these states in 2020? They're critical, but you know, in 2008. Uh, going into election night, David Pluff, who was the campaign manager for Barack Obama in 2008, said, we're not going to be sitting around on election night waiting for the results from one state to come in to determine who's president of the United States. So we're going to stop putting all our eggs in one in one basket. We're going to stop sort of depending all on Iowa. You remember in that Kerry race, it was all about Ohio. That's just not the way it should, it should be, especially given where this country is. I mean, look, I love Ohio. I, you know, um, Columbus, Ohio is one of my favorite uh, uh, small cities in in the in the country, but and people don't Ohioans don't send me nasty messages. But from a a, a completely strategic standpoint, the future looks a, a lot more like like the Sun Belt and the West than it does Ohio. We talk about this this drop off and folks from uh, the Obama years simply not voting in 2016, and you see, you know, we saw what happened. Do you have a sense from early voting and a, apparently there's like these record numbers? Tremaine, you've hit on something which is, mm-hmm. which is going to make me say something that I'm not comfortable with. If you look at the early voting stuff, I think it was yesterday. I haven't looked today, but you had close to seven million voters who already early voted almost two weeks out, who didn't vote in 2016. Wow. Seven million. Whew. Who didn't vote? Who didn't vote? That means, wow. what does that mean? That means we have no idea what the electorate's gonna look like. And what I can tell you is, you know, even on a liberal side of what the electorate's gonna look like, I think we might be off the mark because of, I mean, we're looking at sort of turnout patterns, like at least early, that and the motivation that I see in the in the data, and sort of we ask questions about motivation to participate. The mm-hmm. the numbers that I'm seeing in the data, I've been seeing in the data for for the last month or so. Tremaine, I haven't seen these numbers. They they they're better than what I saw in 2008. Um, you talked about the Russians earlier and all these disinformation campaigns about mail-in absentee ballots and all of this stuff that is always obviously armed against black folks. But the, what's the end goal of that kind of disinformation? And like this cycle in particular, with all of the other motivations, Trump, you know, leading among them and his actions, does that stuff work? Is it working? Yes, it does work. I mean, there, voter suppression works. And voter suppression is real. When, when they are rem- removing polling places from from predominantly minority areas, when they're making it harder for people of color to vote, 
yes, that has an adverse effect. You know, it's a double-barreled thing, right? Because, because one, they want to make it seem that the system isn't credible, and then they make it harder for you to, act, to actually participate. So, they're, so it's, it's a two-track thing where they're undermining the credibility of the system. And, and look, when I hear this cycle, which is something I didn't hear in the Obama years, I hear younger people, and particularly younger people of color saying, you know, my vote doesn't matter or my vote doesn't count. Well, they are driving that intentionally, this idea that your vote doesn't matter and your vote doesn't count. And then on top of that, they're making it harder for you to actually uh, participate uh, in in the process. And that's just straight out voter suppression. And does it impact? Yes. Colonel, let me ask you this, man. You you obviously know how the sausage is made. You know, you've made some sausage. Is there any particular thing that, that you will be watching closely as an indicator of how this might be? Something that could give us a sense of, you know, how things might play out? I think they're, I think they're going to try to sow chaos on election day. I think they understand that that Donald Trump is not well positioned for re-election. And at this point, really the only thing they can hope for is is chaos and shenanigans. But I'll be looking at I'll be looking at that stat line about these sporadic voters who are now participating. If the electorates in some of these battleground states are one or two points more minority than it was in 2016, I'm gonna look for that. Because if they are, and to our point, they're they're you know you don't have eight or nine percent of younger voters breaking third party, and younger voters of color in particular breaking third party, and Joe Biden's garnering eighty eight to ninety percent of that of that vote, of that vote overall, and that electorate is is one or two points browner than it was in twenty sixteen. Uh, it's hard for him to lose. Cornell Belcher, man, thank you for joining us. You obviously have um, one of the best brains in politics, and you are more than your hair, but you also, for, for people who have never seen you, have the best hair in the business, man. It's, it's <laughs> you know, in, in a dream, I might have, I, I grow mine on my face, not on my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I appreciate that because a lot of my friends are now losing their hair, and I like to just keep growing mine and flaunt it. Cornell Belcher is a Democratic pollster, MSNBC analyst, and runs a polling and strategy firm called Brilliant Corners. Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Barbara Rabb, Claire Tai, Aisha Turner, and Preeti Varathan. Original music by Hannes Brown. Our executive producer is Ellen Frankman. Steve Lichtai is executive producer of audio. I'm Tremaine Lee. We'll be back next week. 